Today, we're going to be embarking on a journey over the next several weeks to learn how to pray. Now, that might sound like an oxymoronic statement. Some could say, haven't we been praying all this time? And of course, even the most seasoned of prayer warriors can always use a bit of a reminder on how to pray. This is why Jesus spends time in his earthly ministry to teach us how to do just this, to pray, to teach us how to have an authentic habit of prayer. There are two instances in particular that are captured in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke where Jesus does just this. He teaches us how to have an authentic habit of prayer. In particular, it is when he teaches us on the Lord's Prayer, a famous prayer that many of us know. But what's interesting about these two instances where we see this moment recorded is the context of which Jesus teaches is different. The context is different in the Gospel of Matthew than it is in the Gospel of Luke. And of course, we understand that this very well could have been just two separate moments of teaching altogether. All the more important and all the more reason for us to look at what it is God has to say, not just in Luke 11, 1 through 13, when his disciples approached him saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. But also in Matthew 6, 5 through 15, where Jesus begins just teaching about prayer in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, this famous sermon found in the Gospel of Matthew, also known as the longest recorded sermon of Jesus's. In particular, these two moments, these two teachings of Jesus that are paralleled in these two different contexts teach us a world of good information about living an authentic life of prayer and taking on an authentic habit of prayer in our lives. It teaches us con critical components of prayer that we must learn to ensure that we can live in a place of authentic prayer. And as we are rapidly approaching Ignition Week, what better time for us as a church to dedicate ourselves to learning about prayer as we enter into this time where we're going to be devoting ourselves to prayer as one. For like the Church of Acts, we want to be a people who not only pray, but make prayer a regular practice in our lives together. In this, we want to see the Lord's supernatural power expressed in areas that we've been battling to see breakthroughs. And in new areas that we'd be pressing into as a church, to see this, we need to be intentional about prayer. Not only intentional about prayer, but prayer together as one body. Therefore, we're setting aside time to make sure we're doing this. That we are developing this habit of prayer together with one another. And this time, we have come to call it Ignition Week. And it is coming soon. Therefore, today, we're going to be embarking on a journey together. We're going to be embarking on a journey of seeking Jesus' guidance on developing an authentic habit of prayer on the cusp of a mission week. With this being said, let us dive into Jesus' teaching in these two moments in Luke and Matthew about how he would have us pray. We'll first turn to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 13 says this, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, Then when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer, 
from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, impotence, sorry, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receive. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When I read these promises of prayer that Jesus makes here in the Gospel of Luke, I just want to shout, praise be to God. But we can't stop here. We have to continue on and dive further into our second reading, our second passage for today in the Gospel of Matthew, the second moment of teaching of Jesus that's found in Matthew chapter 6. In particular, we'll be reading verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you will need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. These are the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. His very teachings, two unique moments of teaching about prayer and how we can truly live an authentic life of prayer and to put on a habit of prayer. For today's purposes, we're going to be keying in on the Matthew section, the Matthew reading in particular, starting with the first four words, which are parallel to Luke's account as well. Words that Jesus says, and when you pray. Verse 2 of Luke's accounts also has these words, when you pray. Jesus says, when you pray. Prayer is assumed by Jesus. No matter who you are to Jesus, prayer is assumed. Whether you're one of his close followers, prayer is assumed. Or whether you're just someone that happened to be on the side of the mount that day, that happened to see the large crowd and said, I want to go over there and see what's going on. Jesus assumes prayer, and his assumption is correct, especially in this time period, as Jews had regular times where they would pray. They had dedicated times throughout the day that they would go to the Lord in prayer. So Jesus is correct to assume his disciples prayed, and everyone else around him on that Sermon on the Mount, that they were all praying when he teaches them about prayer. So he says, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray. However, can that same assumption be made today, not just by those inside the church, but to those outside the church as well? 
I would argue, yes, it can, because even the avowed atheist, as one commentator once put, put it, will turn to prayer to something, somehow, in their most darkest of hours, in the desperate times of m moments, something I'd like to call urgent prayer. Urgent prayer as a last resort in the times of great need. Or when we just want something really, really, really bad. Treating God more like a cosmic candy vending machine in the sky rather than the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Rather than treating him with the reverent love and respect he deserves. And the sad reality is this isn't just people outside the church that treat prayer like this. People inside the church does. And this is what Jesus is trying to address here in Matthew. He's trying to teach us how to pray when we pray, because prayer is assumed and his assumption is correct, we're going to pray. And so he's saying when you pray, he's going to teach us what not to do so that we can learn what we should do. That we wouldn't treat him like a candy machine. Press 8-3 to get that Snickers bar that we would actually approach God with the reverent re love and respect that he deserves. Understanding we may press A3 all day and not get that Snickers bar, and that's okay, for it is God's will be done. God's will and reign on earth as it is in heaven that he teaches us to pray. Hardly, rarely is there a developed habit of prayer beyond urgent prayer in the lives of many today. Hardly ever is there a habit of prayer that seeks God in prayer daily throughout the day. That prayer that Paul would encourage us of to pray without ceasing. Hardly do we ever see this in the lives of those who follow Jesus. A habit of prayer like Daniel from the book of Daniel 6.10 when it says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem, he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. This document that it mentions had been signed was a law that made such prayer illegal. It made such prayer illegal for Daniel and all the other Drew Jews who had been led away in captivity, illegal to the point that it was punishable by death. Yet alone, prayer... Prayer is still a vital part of Daniel's life. Prayer is still a, an essential habit in his life. Daniel still seeks out the Lord in prayer. Hardly ever do we find ourselves praying three times a day, yet alone being able to do it under such persecution and such demand. However, all this is to say, simply, prayer is assumed by Jesus and rightfully assumed by Jesus. So it's not if we pray, it's when we pray. When you pray, he says. When you pray. And you know what the wonderful thing is? Because he's going to tell us about all the things that we do wrong in prayer here in just a second in Matthew. He tells, he says, when you pray, and he, he lists off, don't do this. And one of the wonderful things about Jesus is, no matter how many times we've gotten it wrong, he's there to pick us right back up and to help us try, try, and try again. Therefore, Jesus says, when you pray, as in to say, let me show you what to do and what not to do when you pray. In particular, how to make sure our prayer lives are authentic, how to make sure our prayer life is proper, how to make sure we approach prayer with the right attitude and mindset. And that's what Jesus teaches us about, is how we approach prayer. Now, if we just take what's on the surface here, we can mistake what Jesus is actually teaching. So let's read again what's on the surface, and then let's dive in a little bit deeper. Starting in verse 5 and 6. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door 
and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now before we jump into the general assumptions made about what Jesus is saying here, we need to understand Jesus has nothing against posture. Jesus isn't speaking towards the posture of prayer, and particularly he does say for those who, who love to stand and pray. There's nothing wrong with standing and praying. In fact, we see Jesus stand and pray time and time again. We also see people fall to their knees and pray in the Bible. We see people fall prostrate, which means to fall face down on the ground and pray. And these are all God-honoring prayers that God receives. And so what we understand here is Jesus isn't talking about posture. He's talking about something else. But in particular, he's also not talking about public or private prayer. Of course, he addresses public and private prayer and that need for us to have that time to be able to go to God privately, to cut out the distractions of our lives, and how it is essential for us to have that quote-unquote prayer closet in our lives, that place where we can go before the Lord and it just be us and him. It gets harder when you have a bunch of small children, right, Jeanette? to have that prayer closet. You might try to use the bathroom, but it never fails. Five minutes after going into the bathroom, there's a knock at the door. Mom, where are you at? (laughs) It's important for us to have those times, though, to separate ourselves, to be just alone in the presence of God. Nevertheless, this isn't necessarily what Jesus is trying to teach us about public prayer. He's trying to teach us something important. In particular, he's trying to teach us to understand who it is we are praying to and why we are praying in the first place. He wants to make sure our attitudes, our hearts are in the right place. And what he's dealing with here, as he calls them, the hypocrites who love to pray in synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. They weren't praying to be seen by God. They were praying so that everybody look, oh, look how spiritual they are. Look how spirit-filled their life is. Look at them pray. You know, I, I see him pray over there on that street corner five times a day, and boy, just look at him. If that's our motivation, we've gotten what we justly deserve, the praise of men. We haven't received the ear of God, though. And that's what God wants us to understand, that when we pray, we are entering into his very presence. When we sing these songs of worship together, we are entering into God's very presence. We're entering into the audience of one. Whether it's done public, whether it's done private, we are coming before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the whole universe, the rays petitions to him and as one commentator stated we should never utter one syllable of prayer either in public or in private until we have definitely consciously understood understood that we have come into the presence of God and are actually praying to him that God sees us more importantly God hears us God gives us his attention in prayer. God is listening to us. The least we could do is do the same for him. To give him our undivided attention. Our ears as well. In Jesus' days, he speaks of the issue of the hypocrites who pray only to look good before man. Which is a problem that we need to be mindful of today. But I think if Jesus were teaching the same teaching today, he would have expanded a little bit here. He would have expanded a little bit here. I would argue in verse 6 where he lays out the solution to how we should approach God, he would also include turning off the TV. He would also include putting this aside. I often think about the days where cell phones weren't a common thing where you, you had to call people on their landline, and um, if you didn't get them, you got their answering machine. You couldn't just text them on Facebook or message them 
uh, and then you couldn't just send them an email because you just didn't have these kind of things just so readily accessible. How did we live in that day? Simply put, it's because we understood nothing was so urgent in our lives that required a reply within five seconds. And this can be one of the greatest distraction in any conversation. Have you ever been talking to someone? I'm guilty of this, by the way. And they're just sitting there doing this. It's just one, one second. I, just, you know, just, I, got, I want to respond to this. I, I'm listening to you. And, and please forgive me for all those times I've done that. I'm a slave to this phone, just like most people are. And when we pray, we need to give God our undivided attention. So when that chime comes through, understanding that it can wait. When we pray, we need to understand that there's nothing more important. There's nothing more significant than the fact that we've come into the very presence of God. And he has lended us his attention. The least we can do is give it back. What Jesus is concerned about is with our heart. And a good prayer habit begins with a mindfulness of what it is we are really doing and who it is we are really talking to. It is, co- it is us coming before God who gives us his attention. Therefore, we should give it back. We should heed the words of advice of prayer given to us in Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 2, where it says, Guard your steps when you go into the house of God. To draw near, to listen, is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know, they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, which is the perfect verse to segue us into the next moment that Jesus teaches on. At first, he, he, he addresses humbling those who are hypocrites and are praying for all the wrong reasons. Now he's going to then address the Gentiles and the babblers. And Jesus shows us this in verse 6, or verse 8 through 7. 7 through 8, and it says this, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. He knows what we need before we even ask Him. Now, just like the previous verses, we need to dive a little bit deeper here. And understand what Jesus is saying on the surface isn't what Jesus is trying to communicate and teach. In fact, there's something much deeper here that he's trying to communicate and teach. In particular, Jesus has nothing against long prayers. Jesus has nothing against those who pray and pray for a long time. Nor does he have anything against repetitive prayer In fact, in Luke 6, 12, we see this. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. I don't know about you, but praying all night, that's a long time to pray. Some people think five minutes is a long time to pray, but praying all night. Jesus has nothing against the length of prayer. He also doesn't have anything against with us coming to God time and time and time again praying for the same things over and over again. In fact, he teaches this in Luke 18, 7. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Will he keep putting them off? The answer is no. The problem here that Jesus is addressing is not length of repetition, Rather, once again, it's all about how we approach God in prayer. In particular, an authentic prayer habit doesn't approach God in prayer as a means to an end. Rather, an authentic prayer habit approaches God as an end in itself. Now, let me unpack those phrases real quick. To to make something a means to an end is to do something only to produce a desired result. Meaning, we do this because we want this. We push A3 because we want that Snickers bar of blessing from God. 
So we're, we're going we're gonna to push A3, and we're going to get our Snickers bar, and that's why we're going to do it. That's what it means to make prayer a means to an end. However, to make something an end in itself means that something that one does because one wants to and not because it helps achieve or accomplish something else. Meaning that when we make prayer an end in itself, as Jesus is teaching us to make prayer, it's not something that we're doing to get something from God. Rather, it is something we just desire to do because we desire the very presence of God in our lives. And we want to invite his rule and reign in our lives. And if we look at the Lord's Prayer, that's exactly what Jesus tells us to pray. Your will be done. Your will be done. Lord, your will be done in my life. No one else's will but yours. Not my will, but yours, Lord. Understanding the classical Beatles song, you don't always get what you want but you get what you need. Sure, we may pray for that blessing of a Snickers bar, but we may get an almond joy instead. And understanding that's okay. Because we didn't pray to get something. We didn't go to God in prayer because we knew if we pray to God, he'll, he'll bestow blessings. No, we went to God in prayer because we desire to be before the Lord. We desire to lift up these petitions to him, understanding that it may very well be that God's answer would be no. But we know that God answers prayer, and because of that, we desire to go before him. You know, I think about this teaching of Jesus in particular, these empty phrases, these repetitive prayers that we can easily fall into, this treating God like a cosmic vending machine in the sky, making prayer a means to an end rather than an end in itself. I think about some of the prayers I prayed when I was a child. Some of the prayers I was taught to pray as a child. In fact, before my family would ever eat, anytime we would eat as a family or as an extended family, we always prayed the very same prayer. Blessed are the Lord, these are his about to receive the mighty Christ the Lord. Amen. I know this prayer frontwards and backwards. I, I, I know this prayer, and this prayer was almost like a magical incantation to me as a child. It was what we had to pray so we could eat. And if we didn't pray it, we couldn't eat. So as quickly as I could, bless the Lord, the dead Christ, about to receive the mind of Christ, the Lord, amen. I would pray and pray and pray it because I wanted to eat. Prayer should never be treated like this. It's a rote ritual. Because it's not with the words we say. And we could change the words of those prayers. We can make the, the, that, that prayer whatever we wanted to. But still, praying before a mealtime as a kid for me was a ritual that you do so that you could eat. It was a means to an end. Not an end in itself. Many times in today's world we approach God in prayer because we want something from God. And I think it's okay for us to petition God for those things that we desire. But it has to be more than just that. It has to be more than just that. It has to be. It has to be more than just a vending machine. Because God is more than just a vending machine of blessings in the sky. He is the creator of the universe. He is the Lord and master of our lives. And when we approach God in prayer, we need to be mindful of that. We need to be mindful of the audience of one we are coming before. I love what Martin Luther, the great 15th century reformer, taught about this teaching of Jesus on prayer. He said prayer should be brief, frequent, and intense. One commentator of Luther's once explained this, for the brevity of prayer can naturally lead to the frequency of prayer. And the more frequent prayer might lead to more fervent prayer. And that's what we want. It is no value to pray for prayer's sake. How far better to pray when you really mean it and when you, your attention is focused where it should be, namely on God. Brief, 
frequent and intense. And that is my prayer for us as we enter into Ignition Week. That we would be able to begin putting on a habit of prayer, each and every one of us. Not doing it because we have to. Not being, oh gosh, it's the gathering time, so let's get up, let's go. But no, doing it out of sheer desire. Sheer desire to be focused to our audience of one. Jesus Christ himself. That we would approach God not of obligation but desire, trusting in his sovereignty over all creation, inviting his rule and reign in our lives no matter what that may mean in regards to what we have prayed. Because we know we may not get what we want. But Jesus teaches us in these moments of prayers which we'll be discovering in the coming weeks. He will always give us what we need that daily bread. I invite you then to continue with me on this journey through the teaching of Jesus on prayer as we prepare our hearts for Ignition Week, knowing this, God hears us, God sees us, more importantly, God knows us. And we can trust him as we seek him fully in prayer through our petitions to him for all the things that we face in this life. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. I'd like to invite our worship team and our prayer team forward for a time of of reflection and response. And I ask that we do just that right now, that we would reflect, that we would respond to God's word. Think about what it is Jesus has taught us, about what it means to have an authentic prayer habit, that when you pray, what it is you should do when we approach God. And the attitude for which we should have before God. In this no God knows and honors authentic prayer. And even though we may not get it right sometimes, he is there to forgive and to help us try, try, and try again. Join me in prayer and worship right now as we look into our hearts and ask God, how have we treated prayer in our lives? And join me in challenging ourselves to take it one step further.